please extend a warm North Dakota welcome to one of the most prolific historical commentators today, Dr. Douglas Brinkley. Well, good afternoon. I won't go on too long here. Uh, I thought it was a terrific morning. Um, really strong talks. I was uh, feverishly taking notes, and I, I, I want to thank the speakers this morning, because this is, I think, when I've talked to Clay about this, um, what you guys are doing here at Dickinson, it doesn't help anything to just celebrate presidents and say, you know, um, you know, TR was great, or Lincoln's great, or Washington's great. Um, it's important to learn why they were so important, but we need to have rigorous academic and, and intelligent looks at what these people really are. And I thought uh, uh, dealing with Daniel Boone and with Theodore Roosevelt uh, this morning in our two, two talks were really uh, eye-opening um, experiences, and it's going to en enhance us. And, I want to encourage Dickinson say not just to keep doing Theodore Roosevelt, but periodically come back to this topic of conservation. Uh, I know there are environmental historians here that have visited, um, and it'd be nice to know that Dickinson is staying engaged in environmental history and uh, every three or four years, um, you know, comes back at this. I think it's a very, anybody hearing um, um, the morning's talk about reclamation versus preservation and uh, the contradictions of that boy it is fundamental to ourselves as a nation right now I, and uh, and looking at our, our our political economy and i think these contradictory sides of roosevelt do tell us a lot about our country today and so it would be a great springboard to continue that i'm supposed to talk about the american spirit um and of course like thomas wolf used to say there are a billion forms of America. Um, and, and one of the reasons I did this magic bus trip in a, in one year I used ethanol, uh, or not ethanol, um, natural gas on two buses and went about 16,000 miles, went all the way up to Alaska bringing about uh, 30 college students. They would earn college credits living on the road. Be like Dickinson students here saying for this semester I'm gonna study American history and literature on the road and off we would go. Part of the reason we did that was believing the classroom can be, be confiding. Uh, that um, like Francis Parkman who I mentioned who President Roosevelt loved his book, The Oregon Trail, there was a um, part of it is getting out and seeing these places. It's pretty hard to want to write about Yellowstone and not go to Yellowstone or write about the Badlands and never seeing the Badlands. Um, this obviously is difficult if you can't afford it. If you're a college student wanting to write about something. It could be Antietam in the Civil War. You don't have the money to make your way out to Maryland and Pennsylvania and poke around. I know that's hard, but I'm a big believer in history by going and seeing things, getting on a train, getting on a plane, driving to it. You learn a lot from the locations um, you know, that you go to. And in that regard, uh, I think it's almost impossible to write about Theodore Roosevelt in a serious vein if you're trying to understand the man without coming here to the western edge of North Dakota and spend time in the Badlands and understand what it was that spoke to him so greatly. It's not hyperbole to say that TR loved this part of the world, and a lot of it is because he saw that this was a... Um, he liked the spirit of the people of North Dakota. In uh, many ways, and when I recently was reading his letters, one of the great things about Theodore Roosevelt scholarship, and it'll sue me online due to your Theodore Roosevelt Center here, but TR was it, just wrote letters nonstop. Now some of these he dictated to stenographers, um, and then he would give it a quick proof read. So I was asked this morning, is it just exuberance? How could TR have done so much? Um, he had learned to speak in full, in full paragraphs. There would be not a, you could not a get a different person in this regard in, in, in the realm of rhetoric than our current president. <laughs> Bush and Roosevelt were very, because Roosevelt's mind, and I think it came from reading so much good literature, he spoke in these kind of sentences. Now, he often would ramble in his sentences, and in fact, 
in his writing, he used semicolons all the time, uh, almost drunk with semicolons. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, who was a friend of mine and just died recently, and I, I did the last big profile of Kurt Vonnegut for Rolling Stone, um, but um, Vonnegut used to say that the, he, he, we had talked once about Roosevelt and semicolons, and he said um, there no need. He believed, he was a belief that there was no need for the semicolon, that it was showing off, <laughs> that a semicolon was the symbol of a show off, <laughs> that really you can just end the sentence. You didn't need that semicolon there. Um, and and Roosevelt, if you read any of his books, sometimes he'd go on for pages using a semicolon in a uh, in a in a in a kind of um, overflowing, uh, unnecessary fashion. But beyond that, he went, one of the things that he could do is really give speeches uh, and can't come up with original ideas. Um, one of them has, the problem with Roosevelt and the American spirit is, um, and what he represents, more than anything, TR was a nationalist. Um, and he believed in uh, what he saw as American greatness and destiny. Now, what, what different, made him different than some kind of crazed jingoist in this regard is he was deeply steeped in world history and the classics. And I'm not saying this in a superficial way. I mean, he absorbed world history. So he really was a believer that the United States' moment in history was upon us following the Civil War at the beginning of the 20th century and that we were destined for this historical greatness. And that way, and it, it, it does have a reason for his conservation, he would beam himself into the future a lot. Um, he would think about what America will look like 100 years from now or 200 years from now. And he really believed in expansion and the sea to shining sea. The fact of the big Navy that he wanted was what his sign or the two countries he admired were Britain and Japan. Um, and he saw them because of Alfred Thayer Mahan, a great naval strategist, sea power and history. And Roosevelt corresponded with these people he loved. All the great intellectuals that he liked, he learned how to strike up relationships with. And there's a great correspondence with Mahan, but he sees that Britain can protect itself as an island and Japan could protect itself, and that they both had, were able to impose their leadership in their regions. Uh, Japan, obviously, in Asia, and, and uh, Britain, in, in Europe, and through much of the world, Great Britain. Um, he, and he, um, so keep that in mind for one thing. He wanted this United States to not just be a power, a great power. He wanted it to be the great power. I think people underestimate the historians that I've read of Roosevelt's general dislike of Europe. Uh, it gets built up a lot because he goes over there and he gets along famously with European leaders and has many smart European friends. But he has an inferiority complex, and I think, as we heard today, I mean, there that you know Roosevelt's inferiority complex about Europe was, um, look, let's put it in that time frame. I mean, the big question when you talk about the American spirit is Emerson's question. What is an American? What is it? Most of you here that are American, if I ran into you in a, I mean, sometimes you can get a visual of what somebody is that's American. By the way, we dress in things and you could spot them out. But TR, it's, it followed this train of thought, and it's, it's something that preoccupied Walt Whitman, who Roosevelt was a, a, a slavish admirer of, and two of his books he quotes Whitman, um, and Whitman's vision of this rolling prairies and the West. He connected Roosevelt that our exceptionalism, what makes America exceptional, was, was tied into the land and the rivers and the two seas, and our bigness. He always wanted Canada. He wanted to take Canada. He was so ticked off that we never figured out a way to get Canada. Um, I read an article, actually, the Theodore Roosevelt Association, a, a guy did a, a, um, an article about Roosevelt disliking, you know, this is the contradictory Roosevelt, he disliked Canada so much he wanted to take it over. The truth is he loved Canada so much he wanted to take it over. 
Uh, his closest friends were Canadians when he went up to um, Maine with Bill Sewall, who came out here and lived. Uh, Roosevelt, as a college kid, has this transformative experience um, when he goes to Maine and he's with these rugged outdoor types. No real education, but could read the land and read nature. And when he's with Bill Sewall up there, this is when he gets infatuated with moose because of their girth and the size of the horns and these gigantic animals that, uh, um, that he became so fond of and identified with. And it wasn't so much hunting with these guys, although that's what they were doing, but they would go on with snowshoes up in the main, the worst conditions. And what shocked Seawall, this out, um, uh, outdoorsman, was how this kid, sickly looking, not very tall, didn't look like an outdoors guy, although he had been weightlifting at Harvard, was sort of out enduring them. Um, Roosevelt's sense of will, I don't know where he gets it from. I mean, it's a, it's, and I guess that's history. I mean, I don't want to be like Nietzsche or something and say about wills to power. And it, it, you know, other people much smarter than me have grappled with this, but he could somehow find, I, I recently, broke a story for on Lance Armstrong, the, uh, um, and I spent some time with Lance I, living in Austin, and he's down there, and I broke the story. He's going for the Tour de France this summer. And he's got the, you know, he had 13 tumors on his lungs. He had two on his brain, and he had t t t t um, lost a, a testicle to cancer. And this guy's going again at 37 to win the Tour de France. Only an idiot wouldn't bet on this guy winning this summer spend a day with him, he's got this kind of inner will that comes from somewhere that the average person or even the above average person can't quite understand what, what it is. Um, there's some windows we have of Roosevelt, his fear of being a feat and being a weakling. There's a famous, I milk this probably too much in my upcoming book, but it's called the Mook, Moose, Lake, or, um, Moose Lake Incident. But TR gets off a train up in the wilds of Maine. And remember, the north woods of Maine was really wild in the 1870s. You could get off at a railroad depot and name a mountain after yourself. People did that. You know, oh, nobody named that one. I'll name it. Uh, and uh, these kids beat him up and hazed him. And um, he said, never again am I going to be the, the picked on one. And the same thing happened when he went to Europe with his arsenic and all of his little kits with scapels to do his taxidermy on his birds. That was his infatuation on his father had encouraged it um, as a skill in the book. But he was obsessive about his taxidermy. And he gets off in Liverpool dressed like the little dandy and all the kids, the Liverpool working kids, shout taunts at him. And he writes in his childhood diaries that, you know, I, they're making fun of me. They're making fun of the way I look, the way that I am. And you start seeing in Roosevelt a way of using hunting and the outdoors as a way to develop himself. I mean, there's a, it be, it be, I think when we talk about parks and monuments, there's a selfless side to wilderness. It's, oh my God, he loves it so much, so he saved these places. But it was deeper than that for Roosevelt. The, he, it, the combination of the gun and the hunting mixed with the health aspects of the asthma, which I mentioned last night, the outdoors and his workout. His father got him weights and he started weightlifting and building Nobody in 1901 or two or three or four or five when he's president, and he's in rough towns in Oklahoma and Texas, there wasn't a man that didn't think Roosevelt was one hell of a tough guy. He spent his whole life wanting that result. Um, yet, he was a deep intellect. And that combination is unusual, a real deep intellect with this guy. And... He was so clever on people. I mean, his in, young, somebody asked today a great question uh, that's hard to answer. What, it, what would Theodore Roosevelt tell you to do with conservation today? There's one answer, Obs be observant. TR believed in exact observation of birds, wildlife, prairie grass. 
He was part of what the Audubon early bird counts. What do you, you're in a great state of North Dakota, and he would say, count. If you see quail, count them. If you go out, make your sightings, report them. I think that's part of Roosevelt's legacy greatly to admire because it's, um, it's the core of us living in harmony with nature is to start appreciating it. In order to want to save a bird species, you're going to have to appreciate it. He loved the pelicans that he saw here, white pelicans mainly, but he used to encounter pelicans here in, in, um, in North Dakota and would tra follow that they would end up in Florida. Uh, he got affectionate to some of these animals. There, I thought when Edmund Morris, the great biography of Theodore Roosevelt, as you all probably know, wrote The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt and Theodore Rex, I thought he maybe was stretching it a tad when he would talk about Roosevelt's ability to de decipher any bird that he heard because his eyesight was so bad. So some great birders had this visual. Roosevelt could see blurs. Now, he lost his glasses once, and he kept a second pair of glasses. From, he went birding one day in upstate New York, and they ran, and they saw a, a, a bird that was rare, and he stumbled, lost his spectacles, and he was blind. And so he always carried a backup pair. When he was campaigning in Milwaukee as the bull moose candidate, the bullet that pierced him, and he used to have the shirt in Medora, and you might still have it there in National Park Service. It's still there. And... Um, you know, there was also a spectacle. These were his bird spectacle cases because he wanted the, to get the exact observation. He carried his backup bird glasses with him um, that when it, the bullet pierced his chest. But he constantly preached detailing what you see in your own backyard. Uh, he got a lot of this from living on the East Coast and becoming enamored with Thoreau and Emerson, but particularly John Burroughs. Burroughs was, of course, a great naturalist of the backyard. He would write long essays on the common robin or a sparrow, or, you know, you see in that sense that he would, you know, um, of, of Burroughs. And if you haven't read John Burroughs, any of you here, if you want to know something to understand Roosevelt and naturalism, Burroughs is a vastly underappreciated American figure. He wrote book after book after book. Roosevelt used to go down to the tenement slums of New York and hand out John Burroughs books to the kids um, in, in tenement houses. And, and Burroughs had great problems with New York City, the teeming metropolis, the fact that the pollution and things were starting to head into the, into the city. Roosevelt as a New Yorker and, after, and, and defines himself as a New Yorker, not a New Englander, um, was very proud of his state's natural assets. Um, I mentioned yesterday, but as governor, he creates the movement to save the Palisades. Um, he wanted the cliffs. He wanted people to enter New York Harbor, seeing it as magnificent. He wanted New York to be the greatest city in the world. And if you lose the cliffs, you lose it. It's part of its aesthetic bragging right. He kept seeing these Europeans and he wanted to believe American cities and bays were as spectacular as the best ones in Europe. But he also has a, a great interest, as I said, in Niagara Falls, the Catskills, and his environmental record as governor of New York where the state had never seen anything like it. And he begins trying to ward off timber companies, um, um, big businesses that want to um, impugn the integrity of the Catskills and Adirondacks. He gets involved with a deer repopulation program because they were all shot out of the Adirondacks. Um, but one of the, the problem that you have to grapple with with Roosevelt on environment is whether you're a hunter or a non-hunter um, in a visceral way. Um, today this, we heard you know, about this notion of, you know, watching the shooting of an animal and they collapse and they're bleeding and somehow you feel good because you get the head of that. Um, and it, today's modern environmentalist, um, it's a, um, to many of them, that's anathem to their view of uh, what, will, what animal is. Why would you want to inflict hurt? Roosevelt's view was that that was put you, that you and I don't have the time to get into it. It's a deeper comp, but he felt it puts you closer with the animal. Um, that it's actually the hunter is actually it learns more about the species, respects it more. Hence his ferocity at poaching. P 
probably if there's one thing all people in the environmental movement would agree to Roosevelt, about Roosevelt, I would think, is this is almost an ab- – at one point when somebody poached in Yellowstone, Roosevelt says, I'm going to go and shoot him in knife in the face is his response. He believed from the old sportsman ethics of Europe and that you had to have hunting license, hunting rules, sportsmen. And these hunters were the early, some of the early, and the sporting magazines were some of the early conservationist uh, um, efforts in the country came from hunters. Today, by and large, we, you, it's more from people um, bird watching or from people that love nature for nature's sake, or people that understand habitat and ecosystems. And in that way, Roosevelt comes to us kind of antiquated. Um, in many ways, his type of conservation, I think, is more understood in red states than blue states, if you'd like, uh, today. Um, but Roosevelt felt, and I think it's key, is always trying to find how to be an American. I've never seen a moment where this guy wasn't promoting the United States every letter, every article. And if he had an intellectual edge to him, he loved seeing great American poetry or a great American book. Now, whether his judgment was great in a critical way is a different issue. But what he thought was, oh my God, we got a great playwright. Oh my God, our philosophers are better than the Europe. We've got the, you know, our swamps are much more dramatic. It could be anything is again, as long as it had an Americanization side to it. He parlayed that with it happened to be a love of his was naturalist. Roosevelt was a first race rate naturalist of that era. He was not a man of, of the detail of, of me. Uh, uh, I don't want to pretend he's of the caliber of a John Muir. But, but he was in that ball. He could play ball in that league with the really handful of outstanding naturalist of his day. It was a very big accomplishment and it didn't come out like politics did. He felt he had to get engaged in politics. It was the one side of the guy that is from childhood to death. It, it, I don't want to call it a hobby because it was more, but he just loved it. I could tell you anecdote after anecdote in the middle of peace negotiations from the Japanese war, he's got Frank Chapman and, and William Dutcher of the American Ornitholo Ornithological Union, he's canceling state meetings on international affairs to talk about bird sightings. Um, he would, he, he got very, he was just what you would think of today. So all I'm suggesting is the hunting side's one side and there's this bird watching side that's another side. And I, ironically, it gives both sides of today's environmental movement or, or naturalist an aspect of Roosevelt they can like. I think that was a point of the, this contradictory, which seems to be the theme here, this contradictions constantly with Roosevelt, that there's not a whole man there. They're there both of these sides and you can pick and choose as you please. Multi-dimensional, as I said, spin them around. You could find what you want on him. That's a native genius because he kind of understood the American mind. Roosevelt liked everyday American people. They used to laugh at him, Henry Adams, and John Jay, who he ended up loving, and, and as, as Clay mentioned, but that set, the Hey Adams set, they all made fun of TR. Here he comes, and they part of they made fun of him was his over-exaggeration of the American West. Oh God, we gotta have a meeting now. Roosevelt's gonna tell us about Pike's Peak, and Roosevelt really believes Daniel Boone and Zebulon Pike were really great, not just backwoods hucksters. In that regard, he was selling Western history to an early generation along with Frederick Jackson Turner in his concern of it. Today, Western historians, the new Western historians can, can pick holes in everything Roosevelt says and say, oh my God, look at this. But he was promoting Western history when people weren't promoting Western. He picked it up from Parkman. And Roosevelt used to say, as Parkman did, I'm right, Parkman's great works on the French and Indian War and, and, um, and you know Canada, Lake Champlain, etc., on um, Montclam and, and Wolf and all of those books of his, he used to say, I'm doing the history of the American forest. That's what Parkman actually said. Um, Roosevelt's love for Parkman knew no bounds. And he, you know, Parkman went blind and was, um, you know, could be, had to dictate things and was trying to do all these writings. And he wanted to be the Francis Parkman of his generation. Be, and he believed that 
Henry Adams, who wrote on the Jefferson administration brilliantly, and hey, are these guys that were reflecting that they didn't get the West, that I own that. In the, Amer in the historical community, Roosevelt felt he was the heir apparent department and that he's the one who understood this region, why none of these other, other um, turkeys did. And the West was because it's where Roosevelt felt the, Amer the real American spirit lay. His, he did not find it in, he, one very telling letter, he does say, you know, I've gone to these colleges in New York and the American spirit's alive there. I've met these kids. And then he rattled off like 15 people in New York and New England that were great Americans. But he would find everybody in these towns in the West great Americans. To, from Topeka's to Dickinson's to, you know, um, Fresno's to uh, San Antonio. And it, it became a, his obsession with him, the West. And I think if he could, so, I think he was in the, where the conservation and reclamation come together. As Roosevelt wanted to create this society in the West that had teeming cities but weren't failed cities. One of the things he's always negotiating with the Japanese about, and he writes, Japan doesn't have the slums we have, that we need to learn from the Japanese against slums, that they, the Japanese, Roosevelt said, bring nature into their daily existence. Now, if he, he went to Tokyo and parts of the day, I'm not sure he'd say that. He was romanticizing Japanese culture's relationship with nature and the warrior-like samurai of the Japanese. That it's kind of unusual combination they had. I think, Ultimately, Roosevelt thought that the, 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 when he went to San Francisco, he said it's shifting, that the country's power is on the Pacific coast. Um, he never liked Thomas Jefferson. In fact, could not stand Jefferson. Although he said Jefferson did one great thing in Louisiana Purchase, which he, because he said Jefferson's genius, when he saw that the Mississippi River was the spine of the nation. So Roosevelt's interest in our region we're talking about, the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific, are, are incredible. Uh, to show you how fickle, though, T.R., that became a topic today, could be and how, how easy you could, could flip him. Do you know, he was very opposed as a naturalist to what they called, um, um, he was called a lumper as a naturalist. He only believed there were a couple of kinds of coyote or cougar or elk in the United States, I, I won't pick each one, that there were three or four different species where Dr. C. Hart Miriam thought there were 12. And Roosevelt and Miriam have huge fights over this. Roosevelt liked, because Roosevelt always wanted in nature simpler classifications for everyday people. He was very big on field books of birds in every home. Every American should know their backyard mammals. So he didn't want Darwinism to get so complicated. So it was kind of a Darwinian debate between Miriam and Roosevelt, but they held it at the Cosmos Club in New York. And Roosevelt, Miriam had the evidence on his side, but Roosevelt overwhelmed him with presentation. And so he probably came out the winner, TR, in this little debate, but Miriam held his own. Miriam very cleverly. This is how well Dr. Miriam knew it was Roosevelt, is out in Washington. And that's when he writes TR, well, I found a new kind of elk and I'm calling it the Roosevelt elk. <laughs> and TR is in a quandary, in a lecture. He's got a choice to make. Do I embrace that there is such a thing as the Roosevelt elk, the Lord, he always called elk lords, the Lord of the Pacific Northwest and lose my, and so do I brace elk and lose my intellectual position? And you know, or, or what do I do? Well, he chose the elk. He, cho <laughs> he chose himself to be memorialized. And I don't, when he went literally, there was probably no bigger honor Roosevelt wanted than to be in, the, you know, everybody was naming a species after them and him to have a great elk. He went that route, Miriam knew how to push his button. And, and uh, I tell you that to just uh, to the, I think what we don't understand as a general public, I'm, I know some of the scholars here do, but look, this was a, the West still, it, you know, if one's going to take this notion of the closing of the frontier, which all the new West historians have kind of blown Frederick Jackson Turner out of the water, but this notion that 1893 
1890 census, something happened in the West that basically the Native Americans have largely been pacified. You start getting reservations, territories, last territories are on the march to statehood. Um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of holes in that. But I think psychologically, if you're saying that the West was closed, which Roosevelt believed, the question was doing the carving. What's it going to look like? What's this West going to look like now? And Roosevelt wanted to encourage the settlement of it. And in those ways, the, the non-thinking of the water issues of the building of this many dams and reclamation projects, well, well-intentioned and, and had positive aspects and still do, by and large, was probably the biggest mistakes Roosevelt made as some of his reclamation, the overbuilding of the West, which is a problem we're dealing with in Phoenixes and Los Angeles and where's the water going to come from. Uh, and so I think... Um, that, that you have to look at that as a, as a problem. On the other hand, Wallace Stegner, one of my favorite writers, once wrote a, a book about a Western cities, saying that they were the future of America were in these Western-sized cities, like Dickinson, or I live in Austin, which we're getting too big now, or Boulder, or Eugene, where you have a, a smaller-sized city with a lot of nature access that's not destroyed and a lot of reserves around you. That was Roosevelt's vision for a lot of those places in the West. The model towns for that, that he, he saw, the, the, the problem was his big reclamation projects over brought people, overused the water, and kind of he sabotaged his own, his own model. One thing historians never do is do what ifs. Like, well, would, if Roosevelt was alive today, what would he do? Uh, we don't know. But I'm willing to make a, a venture with you here on the issue raised on the table um, this morning about Anwar. The Roosevelt would have been opposed to the drilling on Anwar. Um, and that, the fact that I feel that strongly after, after living with it, um, Roosevelt never liked, the, first off, Roosevelt never liked oil. He didn't like the automobile. When he was president, he stopped. A guy had, had a couple of hand-raised buffalo, and they were letting the buffalo run on their property. And they do this now in Texas with exotic pets. They bring in African pets, let them run on these ranches, and they would take cars and go after the animal and shoot them. Roosevelt ordered federal troops to the ranch to stop the killing of the buffalo on the ranch. He always had a romantic vision about wildlife and wilderness as himself as the man on the horse with the rifle. I used, recently collaborated with Bob Herbert of the New York Times, a columnist, and, and fed him some documents that Roosevelt turned back all oil money from Standard Oil when he ran for president in 1904, not wanting to be trapped with the oil lobby. He challenged the railroad lobbies a great deal of his life, including, as I mentioned, stopping the segregation of Yellowstone Park. Roosevelt, as a wilderness warrior, was not afraid to stand up to these companies, which is more than many people do, do today. And he would had a great appreciation for Alaska, the Arctic. There was an Arctic polar explorer named the Roosevelt that he was very excited about. And as his, if you read the bulk of his writing, I think he would understand the sanctity of a wildlife refuge where the space mattered. The worst argument on a place like Anwar, I believe, if people say there's nothing there, you know, uh, that's like saying there's nothing in a swamp like they used to say, or there's nothing in a desert. I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding of an ecosystem. And so I, I don't, I think on that issue, Roosevelt would be um, wanting to preserve wild Alaska. And that's my final point. Wild is Roosevelt's favorite word. Now, he talked about unmarred beauty. He talked about heirlooms being passed. He was purposely believing that, and this is where Turner's frontier thesis kicks in, that you need psychological valves for, of wildness, wilderness areas for wilderness sake. Not that the country had to be girded with them, not that you didn't build a Los Angeles or build a Phoenix, but you had to have these places because it was part of the strenuous life. It was part of the sense of re, a kind of rejuvenating of the American spirit 
because he believed in the historicism of the wilderness building the American character. And if you took away the wilderness, you lose the American character and you lose the American spirit and you get developed and built up like Europe. Roosevelt couldn't believe that he climbed to the top of the Matterhorn and he didn't see a ram. They killed all the wildlife off the, oh, it's gorgeous. They're beautiful Swiss chalets. He stayed at a hotel. He went to the top spectacular views. He joined the Alpine Mountainers Club and all. And he writes that there's no, wild, there's no wildness about it anymore. They took away the wildness. So I think the, an aspect to keep in mind about the Roosevelt and American spirit is how do, do we today, not for our generation, obviously from a financial point of view, getting minerals and I mean in 19, when he stopped the, the mining of the Grand Canyon 1906 obviously there were some economic benefits for people living in Arizona territory out of the zinc out of the copper out of the asbestos but Roosevelt's constantly telling people you got to do public policy for future generations unborn and way in the future it gets back to him thinking about America a thousand years from now I don't know a single president in American history that's taking a shellacking because they did too much for our National Park Service and our national monuments and for, and for preserving. There are going to be regional hatreds of those. Lyndon Johnson did this or that. By and large, presidents get upward, and Bill Clinton knew this. When Clinton's, I don't know if you know the story, but Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt put on a sheet of cards, this is not an apocryphal story, he put Theodore Roosevelt and listed all these places that Roosevelt saved. Other card, Bill Clinton, like two. <laughs> and Bill's like, what do you, what do you, he said, well, you wanna be Theodore Roosevelt? Babbitt used TR to get Clinton to do stuff because Clinton was smart enough to know legacy-wise you don't, you're not, not going to hurt you. You're saving part of you. It might take political cost at the time, but from a long lens of history, and we're talking about a planet shrinking, talking about resource management on a global level. We're talking about climate issues. We've got huge issues. I don't think any president in the past that kind of really did a lot for conservation is taking a beating in history for doing it. Um, and, and yet the currency of the moment it's that pr problem of what's the economically right thing to do. We talked this morning about Hetch Hetchy. I find it to be the great, great, a great blunder on Roosevelt's presidency. I've had to ponder it because so much of what he thinks would lead to an opposite conclusion and he had to make the decision for the economic decision of the moment, which was the San Francisco earthquake had devastated San Francisco. There was mass homelessness there and that there was this movement, and it's not an excuse, but he was doing what was expedient for the people alive at that moment. And that's what most politicians do. You have to. However, great politicians think about future generations, and it takes a different kind of leadership to think about the future in a positive way. It takes a few great ones. Roosevelt, with a lot of black eyes here and there, had that ability to project in a way that I think we all should be grateful for because I do find our land system in this country, when we look at all things America's done since the Civil War, abolition of slaves, I think the creation of our national parks and our preservationists with all of its inherent flaws and mainly are not properly funding them, not properly maintenancing them, um, not being more, doing more, but we've got an accomplishment here. You want to do triumphalist history? I think the fact that we've went in and saved a lot of these places is great. The challenge is going to be it doesn't it, just because you save the Everglades doesn't mean the Everglades is going to is is uh, going to be here forever. If we don't, if if all of the incursions of civilization and development puts on these special places, they'll collapse. That, you know, and that's, I think, the challenge where Roosevelt can be a positive force here is not to say, here's what Roosevelt did. He didn't have the advantages that we have of so many things. 
Let's be honest, they didn't have DNA readings and banning on birds feed and video flocking migrations. The zoologists and ornithologists shot birds to study variations of them. That's what they did back then. To make the leap that today Roosevelt would be shooting birds to stuff. It's, he was enough of an ornithologist that he would have evolved, I believe, out of what were the habits of his day. But if you put Roosevelt in his time, for 19, his president, 1901 to 1909, he had the most sophisticated view of the need to preserve American special spots as any person in politics. It does not mean he had as advanced view as John Muir or, or, or John Burroughs. I'm not saying that. But you got to deal with people in the political realm. Roosevelt was the most advanced. And so I think it's, it's a reason to honor him at a conference like this on conservation um, for, for being in the game, um, for making a lot of mistakes and making a lot of calls right. I mean, and you can chair pick them. You could say, Hetch Hetchy mistake, Grand Canyon got right. And you can go around the board um, and, and, and do it. But I, I particularly think on the preservationist realm, Roosevelt and birds and his believing of the beauty of birds and their noises and, and the fact that he could close his eyes and tell you what the bird is was its sound. There are only two people I've ever written about that had that gift. Henry Ford, for all of his anti-Semitism and problems he had, Ford's genius, he could walk in and hear a machine tilt his ear and tell you what wasn't working. He had an ear. Uh, most of us don't have an ear for mechanical sounds. Roosevelt had an ear for birds. Uh, when it's not hyperbole when he says the sound of a you know of a metal lark is more beautiful than a Brahms symphony. This is not BS from Roosevelt. This is how he feels. Um, he was spiritually moved by by bird sounds and the fact that he didn't just rest at that. Henry Ford was a bird lover too. And, his, and went to Congress. The only time Henry Ford went to Congress to fight was to save birds while his industrialization was what was undermining it. So they, these are complex things. But Roosevelt's, the American spirit for Theodore Roosevelt was tied to wilderness. We can define wilderness in a hundred different, everybody's difference of wilderness. An Alaskan's view of wilderness is gonna be different than a Manhattanite's view of wilderness. And this is, you know, Roderick Nash and others have talked to I me. Mean, there's no one definition of wilderness for us. But what, how Roosevelt interpreted it was open space with wildlife, with the feeling of early dawn of man, where man and nature were in some kind of harmony. He did not think that should run American society. He didn't want to go backwards. He was not a Luddite. But he felt that we had to have buffer zones to access that, that a Manhattanite had to get into it. In many ways, it was an elitist view, even though he would say the lands are for the people. Only people that can afford to take a journey up to Glacier, you know, is a certain type. At any rate, I want to tell you that I'm, I'm going to end because I think I'm going on too long here. But I think that the, just to keep, if I had to sum up Roosevelt and the American spirit, it's the value of wilderness. Thank you.